The Print of the Cuff, presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, Corporate Partner, AU Small Finance Bank. Welcome to this edition of Off the Cuff. Uh, we are at the lovely residence of Rohini Nilikani, and she's here in conversation with Shekhar Gupta, our editor in chief, and myself, Sandhya Ramesh. Rohini is an author, writer, and a philanthropist, and her new book, Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar, is out recently. Thank you so much for being with us, Rohini. It's lovely to be thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you, Shekhar. It's a great pleasure to be and on thank your show. Thank you, Rohini. Thanks for organizing this beautiful weather and rain just to make us Delhi Wala <laughs> feel even more miserable I'm about sorry, ourselves. I'm sorry, but the monsoon has been pretty kind to us here. Yeah, we've been waiting for it this year. So, uh, so tell me, Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar. Do you put them uh, in an order of precedence or it? So the whole uh, is Samaj most important, Sarkar yeah, second most important. Yeah. So the whole important. idea of this book, Shaker, and is based on a lot of the work I've been doing for the last thirty years, but also because of the people I've met, and especially I recount an incident in the book where this whole idea of how the Samaj is really the foundational sector, and the Sarkar and Bazaar are created for Samaj, right? Um, uh, Bazaar didn't come first. Markets didn't come first. The state didn't emerge first. Society emerged first in various forms. And today, I feel that we need to really understand how important Samaj is as the base, foundational first sector. Sometimes civil society organizations are called the third sector, but that doesn't make too much sense to me. I think Samaj, which is the first sector, and its representative institutions, which are civil society in all its forms, is the first and foremost sector for which Sarkar and Bazaar were created to enable the larger public interest. All three must work together. No question. You can't do without Sarkar and Bazaar. But I just kind of wanted to focus on the fact that if we all understand that we are human beings and citizens first, and then in whatever identities we have in our Bazaar form, or whether we are working with government, but always remember that we are Samaj first. Well, I mean, thanks for reminding me uh, that civil civil society is called the third sector. Because we have forever been called the fourth estate. That's true. So we, we know we know our place. It comes <laughs> right. last of all. Right. When did the when did the spark for the book come in? Because I know a lot of it may be a collection of what you've written, but still to put together a book is additional work, and I fear nothing more than one more day. <laughs> like. No, uh, no. I felt it was time to put everything in one place. A lot of people gratifyingly have been using the phrase now, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, and uh, while. For hundreds of years, people have talked about the role of markets, society, and the state. Uh, I thought this was the time for me to write my particular take on it and bring together all that I've been speaking and writing over the years. So I felt this was a good time to bring it together when people are already using the phrase a lot, and I wanted to clarify what I meant by saying that Samaj is the foundational sector. So it gave me an opportunity to write 10,000 new words and put together some of uh, the old stuff that I have, and hopefully the book will do well. More than anything, uh, Shekhar, uh, more than the book doing well in that way, I want it to be a conversation starter. The whole idea, the reason I put it out in the Creative Commons, the book is available to buy, yes. but also available to download. And for the goal free. of that is, especially young people should be able to download it for free and use it to trigger conversations among themselves about how should we think of Samaj. And how should we think about the accountability of Sarkar and Bazaar to Samaj? What does that actually mean? So for me, this book is like a conversation starter. It's an invitation to deepen the public discourse. And you've also been a proponent of having young people in the Samaj participate in the Sarkar and uh, also involve themselves with the political process. Yes. Can you elaborate that uh, a little bit? What can young people do to actively help the political scene in India? I think it's very important. Young people are usually idealistic and we are such a young nation. Young people are idealistic. They are looking ahead. Right? Many, some of us oldies are looking back, but young people like to look ahead, their future lies ahead of them. And I think in a country like ours with its extreme diversity, with its very uh, lively debates, 
I think young people need to be involved in these debates about India's future, about India. And more importantly, I think because of course there are so many problems in society. When young people begin to get involved in becoming actively a part of finding solutions in their neighborhoods, in their communities, we find one is it helps them to develop, of course, a sense of community, but it helps them to develop their critical thinking. It helps them uh, also to learn leadership skills. And also I find when I talk to the many, many, many young people in the organizations we support through our philanthropies, they find a purpose in life. They feel there is more meaning than just uh, you know downloading whatever the latest thing is on social media. They say such things to us and uh, they themselves get excited by the work they do. So I think young people being part of active citizenship is very important in a democracy like us. So we try to support many organizations that gather local people, especially hyper local action to solve local problems. And we can also see that young people are actually more politically aware now, especially teenagers and people in their early 20s uh, in terms of climate legislation uh, and environmental impact all over the world now. We can see a lot of younger people participating True. and asking for political change as well. True. So to involve more citizens in this process, what can institutions do and people who are at the heads of institution to make youngsters more politically aware? Yeah, I don't know how much uh, can be done through government. I think we do need to look at more public policy and programmatic funding around helping young people uh, to, create, to, to create institutions that build more social capital. But that's one part of it. But I think it's really up to civil society institutions to help develop this youth muscle to get involved, to get engaged. We need more debating clubs. We need more book clubs. We need more such things. There are lots of sports clubs and other such things. But I think we need more ways. One of the things, one of the interesting um, projects that we are supporting is an organization called Kshetra, which actually takes off from the work I did uh, on uncommon ground many years ago to bring corporate and social sector people together. So what Kshetra does, it is developing a curriculum to help people engage in processes to reduce and prevent conflict. So you're able to, through that process, you can sit in the other person's shoes and you can actually understand different positions and then therefore evolve your own. I think more of that kind of thing, but that's really in the hands of civil society institutions. But I do hope, especially for young males in this country, and we have almost 180 million of them, um, just like we had a lot of public money and attention on women's self-help groups, I feel like we now need to think, what is the right formation for young males? They're also confused, they're also scared, they also need mentoring and support. So there is a lot of scope to do some of those things, I do believe. In fact, I'm interested that you say this because a lot of the young men, the also a lot older men, they find it very difficult. They are quite disconcerted dealing with a situation where women are much more empowered yes. than they are used to uh, seeing them to be. Yes. And uh, this requires a lot of reorientation in their own mindset. Yeah. And we mustn't, uh, we mustn't push that under the carpet. A lot of the backlash you're seeing in the world is because men are feeling insecure in some situations right. when women have had opportunities to go ahead. And the last thing we need is to roll back women's rights and women's freedoms. So taking males along with us on this journey. So one of our philanthropy portfolios is focused on that. And uh, when we began, there was hardly one or two organizations working with young males. Today there are 17 and growing. So I think helping young males achieve their potential, be able to speak freely, to be able to speak safely, is also something that's very important when it comes to the youth of India. This is so counterintuitive. Uh, did you, uh, I mean, did you, like you said just a couple of minutes back, that to get someone to sit in the other's shoes, yes, right, and see how how that feels. Yes. Did did you do that to yourself, or did you go through that experience experience before you figured that you had to think about men? Yeah, because uh, Shekhar, my earlier work, whether it was on water or education, there's a lot of focus on what was happening to girl-child 
or or women in villages who are trying to access water resources or have a voice in how this local budget should be spent so there's a lot of gender focus on women but as i was traveling around the country i would often meet young males who who were feeling left out who had questions that could not be answered who didn't know where to turn and i began to think slowly that perhaps something needs to be done about this so we started this portfolio um to work with young men and boys the idea being that you can't even get women's empowerment unless men themselves also feel empowered and what does that mean what what is the gap we need to fill so that all genders can reach their potential what should society be doing see i always come from the samaj lens what should can samaj do more of to help its own citizens its own communities and it's been a very interesting journey men do feel a bit threatened young men sometimes and they struggle to see what what is our role we are supposed to be providers but we ourselves feel insecure about the future of jobs how fast things are changing they feel they cannot catch up with the new technologies so there's a lot of unease and then they become ripe pickings for all sorts of other things so it's very important to create positive programs for young males in this country and the nature of discourse for young men yeah. and their place in society like you said where women are getting empowered yeah. and just institutionalized sexism and toxic masculinity also i try not to use men. the word toxic max- masculinity because i don't think i would like it if somebody said toxic femininity right so i think we should avoid that phrase sure i think uh, how do we get uh, men to feel less threatened yeah. i think that is yeah something more interesting you know it's fascinating uh, the way you put it uh, trying to see the picture from the other side uh, because one of the vantage points from where i look at things is my own reading of military history and uh, because that's the kind of stuff i've been covering yes so the armed forces have a system whereby uh, when they plan an operation uh, they check it out whether it will work or not so they assign a bunch of officers to be the enemy, enemy correct and then they make the moves that the enemy might make except in the armed forces whatever the boss thinks is always right mm-hmm. uh, but that's a, that's a good scientific practice yeah uh, to look at i mean it's simple uh, strategy right you have to do modeling of different scenarios similarly see i worry sometimes that all of us are getting fixed in binaries right whereas most of life's nuances are in the grays and so to prevent people from falling into binaries you have to have the dialogic process to be very healthy in a society especially in a democracy like ours so how do we encourage how do we encourage the dialogic process so that you don't break down into divisions uh, that are just us and them enemy friend those are too simplistic it was all right when we were very very young i think the nation has to um encourage critical thinking so that more people can live in the grays um and uh because sometimes binaries lock you in hmm. also binaries put you under pressure to conform correct to one definition or one side or the other and young people don't like so much to conform uh, also you, you need you some remember the you, you need some spaces you know everybody's yeah. fleet footed you correct. need uh, you need spaces correct um i was you had mentioned earlier that you've worked with water yeah. so i was wondering if we could segue into that and yeah. if you could tell me a little bit about um what the water situation was like in india when you began your philanthropic and societal work with water and where is it today how has it progressed yeah so this is the thing about philanthropy right you can't really solve any problems that way because these problems are so huge and complex so um, I went to a senior official when I was thinking on building beyond water into food. So he said, uh, uh, "Man, I greatly respect." He said, "Khatam, pani ka sab sab solve kar diya tum logon ne. Ab dusra kuch dhoond rahe ho." I said, "No, sir, it's not like that. But you can work parallelly on many things because everything is connected. Food and water are so connected." No, but so the, to answer your question, when I came into water in 2005, we had just begun to see. how water as a key resource was going to affect everything in india the economy the ecology and of course people's health so we started working on this i was there for about 16 years after we started working in water i just retired from argyam uh, which was the foundation i set up for water but i think india knows its hydrological issues much better and there's very good policy 
Now, as usual, it's everything comes down to implementation. I would say the government has made several strides. Successive governments have made significant strides on providing better drinking water, better sanitation. Uh, we still have huge problems though that are going to be climate change related for which there are no easy answers. Our groundwater situation is not exactly healthy in about two thirds of our districts. So there's a lot more work I had to manage a scarce resource well. Uh, but I would say we have quite a bit of the policy frameworks right. Now it's always the matter of implementation. And I think Samaj sector also has a lot to do. Everybody can contribute to improving the water situation. So uh, it's something that Samaj Bazaar and Sar, in fact, Bazaar is also very much involved because they know that even for industry in this country to run, you have to increase water efficiencies throughout the supply chain. And I think all that awareness has come. But long way to go. We don't know what will happen with climate change. That's my big worry. Yes, for example, if you just look at uh, the rain map of the region, yeah. uh, to our north and the east, China has a withering drought. In a large right landmass, Yangtze, the Yangtze, 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 Yangtze is gone the dry. Pictures of the Yangtze it's gone dry. Uh, Pre Christ uh, uh, sculptures, Buddhist sculptures are coming out. Rising now. up. They are, they are rising up. And at the same time, to our west, Pakistan has 700, Seven. some parts of it has 700% have, have more rain this year. Yeah, just a In severe fact, floods. You see, if you see satellite pictures of Pakistan, it looks like there's a giant lake in the middle of Pakistan. There has been a new inland and, and, water body. And India yeah. has such uneven rain this year. Yeah. So, so this is beginning to hurt everybody. It is. And therefore, it's very hard for farmers to predict. It's very hard to plan ahead for your crops. Um, and uh, because farmers are essentially entrepreneurs, it really makes their life much more difficult to adjust for climate variance. And uh, so again, a lot of public policy support is needed. And also, Shekhar, often I've been saying, I think that, I don't know if that article is included in the book, but we are going to have to model for climate change in any kind of policy formulation going forward, in the design of public infrastructure going forward. Today, would you take a decision for a coastal road in Mumbai, knowing what you know about what's happening to the sea rise? So planning for that is going to be something very critical for experts to get involved. Yeah, because the thing about climate change is that no matter what you do, it's not going to get better. It may get less worse. Yes. But it's not going to get because better. Because it's already started. Yeah. The process yeah. has started. Yeah. So you're just trying to slow it down. Yeah. And if you see the IPCC's latest report, it's happening much faster than the scientists thought. Yeah. So which is why the commitments to reduce carbon emission and to increase renewables is so critical, along with designing better public transport around the country. Well, I just yesterday I just saw a model uh, model of the new stadium that has been built in Qatar mm -hmm. for FIFA World Cup. Mm -hmm. It's the world's first fully air conditioned football wow. stadium. So just think about it in Qatar, a fully air conditioned stadium. And it's not as if the stadium has a ceiling, it's air conditioned from below. So imagine the amount of carbon that will be produced as a, as a consequence. An engineering marvel, but not yes, sustainable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and engineering, it, it was de demonstrated to me by LNT people. I so that becomes a challenge for all citizens to get involved no? with, in the sense that knowing what we know about the race against time right now, how should we be thinking about even what about design in our lives, in our, our consumption patterns. Everybody has to think. So in a sense, we are all in it together. Yeah. Even our personal choices in terms of, for example, future real estate and things like that we might invest in. We have to be aware of the climate repercussions, which is not an industry wide practice right Correct. now, right away. Yeah. I mean, our coastal areas are going to be so vulnerable. Yeah. With so much of our population in the coastal areas of India. And then the Gangetic Plain, where again we have so much population. Will people be driven inward? What does it mean then? And this is, we are talking 20, 30 years from now. I don't envy the government have to think about the future. But it's no doubt that every year there are extreme events that are constantly challenging our infrastructure. Yeah. I think the climate deniers will have to go. Yeah, on. absolutely. Well, I mean, while we are debating this, Trump may come back. 
<laughs> don't know. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Just don't know. So public uh, public debate. Uh, you've written this book because you want this to become center stage in public debate, and th these are things because we also work on the principle of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, how much does public debate contribute to shaping of policy, particularly in today's kind of situation where uh, democracies have strongman governments? We're usually thinking comes from one leader and it's not just India, it's India, it's, I mean, okay, Russia, is a bad, Russia and China are bad examples, but America until under Trump, Erdogan, uh, Israel under Netanyahu, you have Bolsonaro in Brazil, these are, uh, Brazil, even more than India, is a very sensitive climate yes. hotspot. So, in these situations and given this strong man uh, power structures, how much does public debate matter? More than ever. As the world is turning more authoritarian, we have to ask why, right? Is it people, people may be feeling that, you know, I don't, I'm fed up of this participating in everything all the time and let me just, you know, uh, sort of abandon or um, uh, trust in somebody, trust in a strong leader to solve my problems. But all through history we have seen it doesn't happen that way. Nobody, as I say many times in the book, you simply cannot outsource good governance only to government. It's too important. If citizens have to co-create good governance, have to themselves strengthen democracy, it's not going to happen for us. If we don't participate, we lose ground. So you, you cannot outsource all these things. You cannot outsource citizenship to anybody else. It, it can be messy. You have to get involved. You just want to lie back and enjoy your life. But if you don't get involved in solving local problems at least, you will find more of this. You will find more of a breakdown of public infrastructure. You will find more authoritarianism on the rise. But that's because you abdicated. So you have to look to ourselves in Samaj. What is happening in Samaj all over the world? And of course, we know social media has had a long, quite a bit of role to play uh, in these last few decades. But I at least believe that you get the governments and societies that you help to create. So if you are not involved, then you get a, you don't get what you necessarily want. You can't expect good societies to form on their own. Everybody has a role to play. Not everybody has to work all the time for it, but at least to some extent being aware of what's going on around you. You can't abdicate this question at all. And so it's more important than ever to get young people to ask these questions. What kind of a society do I want to live in? What is my role to create the kind of society that I want to live in? How much am I willing to give up everything to a government to do? How much can government do for citizens if citizens don't do for themselves? These questions have to be alive in the public discourse. And now more than ever, now more than ever. Um, as a philanthropist, you've contributed to so many causes. Are you hopeful that in a few years, maybe a few decades, we would eventually get to a place where citizens would not need philanthropy? Yeah, I mean, I'd love that to happen because as uh, Martin Luther King's quote, which um, I don't know the exact quote, but you should never forget why philanthropy is needed in the first place and what, what caused this imbalance to come so that there is concentrated wealth in the hands of a few and then they have to do all this philanthropy um, to, to correct for what uh, should be going better in society. Um, so I think uh, philanthropy is critical and important um, but and I don't think there'll ever not be a need for philanthropy because after all philanthropy, what is philanthropy? It means people being interested in the welfare of other people. That's really what philanthropy is. Now, because of the hyper wealthy that have come around the world, philanthropy has become something like really big where people like Bill Gates have to spend five billion dollars a year on philanthropy. So um, philanthropy will have to always exist. But philanthropy is not only that of the super rich. Ordinary people can also do philanthropy and they do routinely in India. So there may never be a time where humans empathy will not be needed and human resources for other humans will not be needed but i do hope there would be less of a need 
for intensive philanthropy to do what society should have done anyway. That, that's really nice. Less wealth disparity and yeah. more so, empathy. Look, I'd yes. rather that there is inequality of wealth and some people have a lot of wealth than the government having, than the state having all the wealth. Well, I think taxation is an important tool yeah, but the state to redistribute. Can't have it all. Yeah. No, I agree that private wealth creates, I mean, societies tolerate private wealth creation because they assume that that wealth creation will spur innovation, right. create jobs, that that wealth creation will also help create better societies, right? It, societies will tolerate runaway wealth creation only so long as that wealth appears to be working for society. The private wealth, so long as it is seen to be working for society, it will be tolerated. Otherwise, the government will swoop in and tax it all up. <laughs> Let me ask this one. So, this is uh, Colonel Kale Vishwanathan, who is one of our subscribers, and he's a, he's a prolific uh, guest on this show. He says, in the introduction to your book, you have a quote, countrymen to rise above self-interest and reciprocity. In my preteen days, late 1950s, there was a custom in our village in North Malabar, where the father of the would-be bride gave a tea party to the village in just with just a cup of tea and one snack was served. Where, where just a cup of tea and one snack was served. The occasion was to facilitate villagers to attend the party and contribute contribute their uh, contribute their might towards the wedding expenses, all on a reciprocal basis. Would you say our Samaj knows and adapts or has adapted to a great extent? And have you concluded that Sarkar and Bazaar are integrating? Um, to the first point, I think that example is beautiful. And in the book, I mentioned what Anupam Mishra, um, uh, who did a lot uh, of work in water, yeah. uh, used to tell us about that. There's a uh, pratha, there's a tradition, in, there still is actually in Rajasthan villages, where people go to other villages to help work on public water projects. So the whole, all the surrounding villages go for the day to this other villages and do shramadan to create public water resources. It might be digging a well or a farm pond or whatever, repairing a bund or whatever that may be, this pre-decided. And in return, the villagers make them a nice meal. The original village in which the work is going on makes them a nice meal. Fun is had by all and everyone feels good and a public infra gets created. And then the same thing is repeated across others. So this kind of reciprocity in Samaj, which is really trust-based social capital is absolutely critical. And we see it in many forms if you travel around the country. And uh, so that's very important. To the second question about whether Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar are integrating, I think we saw the best example of it during the pandemic. Lots more will have to be done when other disasters come along, as unfortunately they will. But we saw how quickly, Samaj of course responded very fast and very quickly. First responders were neighbors, families, um, civil society organizations. State came in pretty quickly after that. And as we know, the bazaar, especially in India, with Serum Institute, etc., was able to act very quickly to get our whole vaccine delivery going. So we saw very rapid action. And I am hoping that that experience will allow to us to be much better prepared because those little bit more of trust has been built. And when the next time comes around, we should be able to organize a bit more efficiently and faster. So I thought that was one of the best examples we saw of the quick integration. I mean, just in two years, imagine how many things happened that had not happened before of Sarkar Bazaar coming together, Bazaar uh, Samaj coming together and so on and so forth. All of us know millions of examples. Look at our vaccine compliance. Yeah. It's so that's where Samaj comes in. Yes. It's we, they quickly got the message that what's good for me is good for all of us. And what's good for all of us, I have to do. Right? We didn't see so much vaccine resistance as we have seen in other parts of the world. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to club two questions that our viewers have about education. Uh, Kaushik Shiva Subramaniam from Reach to Teach asks, how do you and your foundation look at technology to improve education? Is it an enabler or could it be a solution that delivers quality education by itself? And as a supplement to that, Dr. Vasanti Vasudev from Osmosis Learning asks, 
What, in your opinion, is an effective hybrid model for classroom teaching, especially befitting rural India, that would leverage technology aided le technology aided learning without marginalizing the role of the teacher? Okay, uh, let me the second one first. So, oh, let me answer the first one first. At the Extep Foundation, which Shankar Maluwada, Nanda Nilekini, and I formed uh, five seven years ago now, uh, we uh, we set ourselves the goal of increased access to learning opportunities for 200 million children by 2022, which is this year. And I think we have kind of been able to achieve that because we were lucky that we were able to work closely with the union government and then 28 other states uh, to help launch the Diksha platform of the government, to, a di which is a digital platform for parents, teachers, children, but mainly teachers to help each other learn how to more effectively deliver their teaching across the classroom and across the school. And it has been quite a success. And luckily it was ready just in time for the pandemic. So that leads into the next question because we saw the uptake rise so rapidly. There were billions, not millions, billions of learning sessions on the Diksha platform and it has steadied at some number like 1 billion or something. Now I don't have the exact data. Uh, so it is now an entrenched form of learning and sharing. So it improves learnability, accountability, teachability because it's open, it's transparent, it's voluntary and it allows uh, especially teachers to share best practices across the country. A teacher in Tamil Nadu can be asking something to a teacher in Bihar and we've seen teachers feel much more empowered because they're able to go on the Diksha platform and get something for themselves that enables them to be more effective tomorrow in the classroom. So just in time sort of uh, ability to learn from the platform. And I think one thing the pandemic has shown us, God forbid, but if there is again having to be a shutdown of schools for any reason whatsoever, this country is geared up. It has the best public digital infrastructure in the world, I believe. Um, but uh, we are ready to be able to reach children with or without schools. I don't think it disempowers teachers actually. Teachers learnt very quickly. Of course, there's nothing that you can never replace the social interaction of a teacher who's in front of you with a teacher who's on a screen. No question of that. But if it happens again, we are ready and teachers have learned how to make the best of their digital tools. So that's all I can say, but I hope we don't have to shut schools ever again. Do you find the adoption of these tech platforms um, happening frequently in government schools as well? Uh, oh, mainly government schools. So mainly government schools. Uh, because this whole thing was developed by the, um, by the government for the whole public school infrastructure in the country. So there are some 12 million teachers on this platform. And this is public infrastructure. It's public infrastructure. Yeah, so it's free. It's free for the free. public. It's free for the public, funded by government. We did a lot of the initial investments uh, as part of the foundation, but it's taken over. It's now the government's own program running almost everywhere in the country. And other things are getting joined to it. So even now, hopefully more civil society participation will happen on the platform. I do hope more bazaar participation will happen on the platform. So I think it's a very rich resource for teachers and students as well. In this context, can I ask a follow-up question from Jayanti Lal Tanna, who says, even after 75 years of independence, why do you think educational standards have remained well below average, especially in literacy and numeracy in our government schools? Yeah. Well, I can see I started work on education in 1999. That's a long time ago. And I have seen a lot of improvement. So it's true that the Asar numbers still are a bit depressing. But you can see a lot of improvement in many areas of the country, for sure. We have already solved our question of enrollment, which was 20 years ago, that was a huge problem. Today we know that, today we know that all our children are enrolled in school. Today we know that there is a huge demand for education. Today we know that all kinds of new technology is being created for improving um, learning in schools. And the new NEP, which is going to be rolled out soon, um, also puts a great emphasis on something I think is absolutely key, which is foundational learning. And the, with the government's full attention now on foundational literacy, 
from class one onwards and even before even now our preschool infra is going to be ramped up so that children are going to get more much better um, educational tools and access for them to be able to start thinking, describing, talking, uh, using creative tools right from age three, I think we will see continuous improvement. And by the way, we still have some first generation students in the country, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of first generation. I think one more generation, you will begin to see a huge difference. Already, if you look at some of the Asar numbers, most Children's parents now have studied at least to class five, which in 15, 20 years is a huge shift. And you'll only see that get better. Now this generation is educated. So their children are going to be able to have a much better learning environment, not just in school, but also at home. So I am very optimistic on this. A lot of thanks to smartphone permeation. Sorry? A lot of thanks to smartphones permeation as well. Yeah, this. there's a lot of smartphone permeation. There are a lot of NGOs that are supporting parents also to help teach their children better. So we will see the gradual but definite improvement in learning outcomes. I'm very sure of it. These are the 10, 15 years in which we are going to see the big leap. So Padmakshi K, uh, who wants, she said she's read your book uh, fully. Uh, and she is asking, can people's participate lead to peaceful coexistence with different sections of people in times of polarization in our society today? I certainly hope so. Um, uh, mujhe bar lagta hai. These are questions that Samaj has to resolve. The government cannot resolve uh, issues of communal tension. Who has to resolve them? We have to resolve them as communities. We have to be able to see uh, how interconnected not just all the people in India are, but the people all over the world are. And just two years ago, we learned that very, very closely. That if a grandmother in one part of the world sneezes, a grandson somewhere else can catch a cold. We know that now, literally. And so, as human beings try to evolve to become better and better, I think no matter what the current waves look like, I think at the, <coughs> below that, I think there is a great human capacity for empathy and coexistence. And we have to tap into that. And to do that, Samaj section, moral leadership of the Samaj only has to come forward. When there were riots in Mumbai or other places, Bivandi, so it was the elders who came together, created Mohalla committees, started a peace building process. I think that's absolutely critical today. And I think Samaj only has to take the lead. You know, these days, because we've not been holding public sessions with off the cuff, usually we'll do it with an audience. Right, that's right. So it's only now that we are growing out of Zoom at least. <laughs> I find, so we get a lot of questions from our subscribers. That's and very our good that we're so engaged. But I find that the quality of questions for this one is of a much higher order okay. uh, than the questions we get. When we get people who might be talking about war in Ukraine, hard politics, money, stuff like that. So that says that uh, that tells us that your your book has struck a chord. So Sandeep Dutt, who's from my good school, I presume he runs a school. How do we explain philanthropy to young people at school so that they look at life full of serving and giving? For look at life full of? Full of serving and giving. Okay. Um, good. Yeah, I think children very early on, uh, need to be shown examples of uh, human moral leadership and generosity. And I think uh, uh, those stories have to be told from family to family. Who, for example, in my family, my grandfather's role in our, uh, was held up as something worthy of emulating. He was a lawyer, but apparently he, he, the reason he didn't make any money, he was very busy patching up the two parties instead of taking <laughs> them to court. So he and his brother used to be called Ram Lakshman in those days in the Belgao district. But uh, he went and answered Gandhiji's first call in Champaran in 1917. And he was among the first group of volunteers who went there to help set up Gandhiji's first ashram in Bithiharva in West Champaran. And he continued lifelong to serve the cause of freedom and so, uh, the independence movement working closely with the Indian National Congress at that time. And uh, his life, simple thing, living, high thinking, working for a cause, service before self, those are the stories told in our families. And if all families could do that to their children, children get 
easily inspire us. How, how could teachers do that in schools? I think they have to go beyond textbooks to bring out stories. Maybe ask the children in the classroom to come with stories of their families. That's always the deepest and quickest connection that teachers can make. So, and there are so many heroes. There are the Tatas, there are the Birlas, there are so many worthy philanthropists that this country has spawned in the last 200 years. We have to keep those stories alive. Because also explaining to children about the neuroscience of giving, you know, there's genuinely a joy to giving. We are wired for that. We are wired to get joy from giving and doing something, going outside of ourselves to do something for other people. It makes us also happy. So eventually, giving is actually receiving, right? And that is also a gift. So I think children get inspired easily by such stories, don't they? And like you said, we are indeed wired for that. It's we our are. evolutionarily, it's our social it's, security. It's, it's evolutionary biology. We are a social species because unless we work together, we will not succeed. We are wired to cooperate. We are wired for empathy. We are wired to feel joy in giving. Um, you are on the board for a three as well. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, can you walk us through a little bit about environmental and ecological research in India and the blind spots and gaps in data? Where are some places that you think uh, we need immediate research and data? Um, that's a large question. But I think uh, like A3 has done for 25 years, we need long term observation. One thing is what's happening in yearly annual cycles and there are enough some sensors and we get some indication of that but we need a lot of institutions, research institutions to have the resources and the permissions because nowadays even permissions are becoming a little tough to be able to go into our wild areas to set up long term monitoring stations. Today we have the National Biodiversity Mission, for example, which is, I think, going to be very critical to catalog our biodiversity and to understand what is changing in our biodiversity map. We need many more such things. We need many more environmental research institutions to spring up so that one thing is we know what is the absolute national treasures of biodiversity that we have in this country. One of the few countries in the world which has so much population pressure and yet because of our 5,000 year perhaps civilizational culture of respecting nature, we have also among the highest biodiversity on the planet. We need to preserve that, not just because it looks beautiful, but because it is the future resource for this country in everything, for medicines, for precious materials, for carbon sequestration. When we think of the hundred reasons why we need to understand and preserve our biodiversity, we need a lot more monitoring stations and the ability for more researchers to go into various wild areas of the country to really understand what is going on. And that's going to be our bulwark against climate change as well, to understand what is happening and to be able to prevent some of the worst parts of it. Um, we have a couple of questions about corporate social responsibility. Um, uh, Colonel Achal Sridharan, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, from Kovai Care says, um, CSR should actually be citizen social responsibility. Corporates give money through CSR for their philanthropy and social commitment. One of the areas that needs a lot of attention is elder living and care, which unfortunately remains quite neglected. So he says, we see CSR money for education, women's welfare, environment, etc. While social value investing is a must for corporates to survive, why do we not see contributions for elder living and care? I think some people are beginning to set up NGOs, especially targeting um, the elderly, because as we know, in another 40, 50 years, we are going to be an old nation. Right now, we are worrying about the population explosion, but we are going to be an old nation with all the attendant issues, right? We've seen See what's, what's happening. happening in China. And, they are, and Japan. And they, are, they are struggling in China with five and a half times of our per capita GDP. Yes. And so can you imagine when, you know, who's going to make the social payments required for an elderly nation? So I, I think uh, this person is absolutely right. We need a lot more Samaj institutions that are focused on improving the lives of the elderly and keeping them active in the Samaj. Um, so, lot more work on that, lot more work on that. A couple of questions from our colleagues. 
I know that your time is I'm committed to many things. Uh, Maithili Hazarika, uh, she's from Assam. Uh, in what ways can a civil society strive when there are frequent instances of crackdown by the government? Yeah, unfortunately, there is a breakdown of trust between the state and civil society actors. And I really wish there wasn't because a strong state really needs a strong civil society and a diverse civil society because the state cannot reach the first mile. No state, however efficient, can reach the first mile where the real problem is, where people are suffering for various reasons. Um, so it is civil society institutions that are most likely to understand what are the gaps that need to be filled so that the persons who at the first mile can be helped. And any strong state really needs the participation of civil society to go with it. So I wish that both sides would do whatever it takes to build more trust. I think um, we have an extraordinarily diverse and vibrant civil society. They are facing some challenges. For example, FCRA regulations are, um, and many countries are now saying about foreign money coming in. But that's a separate thing. Just among our civil society um, organizations, I wish we could find a way to build better bridges with the state, both at the local level and at the center. I think it's needed because civil society is needed to provide a mirror to what to governments and to societies as well and to the corporate sector as well um, because then it allows for healthy self-correction and it allows for healthy preventive correction. So because I belong to civil society, I wish we could find ways to build many more bridges of trust for which we need transparency on both sides. Sukriti Bats, who is one of our youngest colleagues, uh, she says, uh, you say in your book, throughout history we have seen society take law in their own hands, which results in, which resulted in vigilantism and violence. Uh, what do you think is causing societal breakdown? We, because we've seen a lot more of it lately. Why are citizens, instead of fighting for proper amenities or bet better facilities, are fighting each other? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's very easy through social media, etc., to create all these polarizations. It serves some people, but it doesn't serve so much well at all. And I believe, I really believe that people have got fed up of these polarizations. They're fed up with this uh, us versus them kind of culture. And I think it's we're at peak polar polarization. I think from now on it has to come down. It can't get worse than this. So I think, again, that's what I say. This is not something that we just write about or read about. Each one of us can do something about it, right? In our own families, we have seen everybody argue with everybody else because some people are on this side, some people are on the other side. That's what I'm talking about. How do we build the societal muscle for dialogue? That is the key thing needed today. How do we practice in small, small doses? Tonight at the dinner table, uh, you know, can I talk to a family member who thinks differently from me without getting all hot and bothered and judgmental? Um, that is the new sanskar that we have to develop in, in, in today's democracies. Because otherwise, all of us are shrinking. We are shrinking into narrower and narrower selves. That's not rich, that's not rich living. That is poor living. So a lot of people are engaged with this idea. How do you reduce the binaries? How do you reduce the polarization? I think we're at peak polarization and it's going to get better. And she has another question, which is a very different question, very different on a very different track. She says, you call volunteerism, volunteerism as the bedrock of society. Uh, and so wh why do we wait for people to become volunteers? There should be a mechanism in place that makes working for society mandatory. For instance, in, in many countries, there is something called work ethic approach to punishment, where offenders are made to do community service as a way of reprimanding them. Do you think that kind of system can be implemented or successful in India? Yeah, I think uh, our jails, our jails, our jails are overcrowded anyway. And more, seventy-five percent of those in our under jails trials. are under trials. Under trials, yeah. Uh, we don't even know if they're guilty. They haven't even got access to a fair trial. So I think that is a huge problem. On August fifteenth, I thought the court had said we should release some of the under trials who've already stayed in prisons for longer than even yeah. if they had been proved guilty, they'd have finished serving their sentences. So I think this is something all of us should worry about. Uh, but the questions of crime 
and punishment are very interesting in any samaj what is punishment to be used for is it for revenge or is it for reform and so this community work idea is something that is very interesting actually for judges to be able to say for minor offenses obviously not for serious crimes to say that you can go and volunteer america does it some other countries do it i think it's something worth trying for sure um so about volunteerism volunteerism can't be mandated right because then it's not voluntary so while there are programs in many countries for even uh, some professions to go and do rural service or whatever there is uh, some things like that can be imagined we used to have uh, the ncc and we used to have all kinds of programs when we were young uh maybe some things like that need to be revived but volunteer volunteer energy has to come from inside it it has to be a swadharma it has to be something about where you do something both for yourself and others and it's because you have that energy to give so it can't be mandated and i hope it never is um i wanted to ask you a different question about children's books mm -hmm. uh about pratham books and your journey with pratham books can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it was like founding it and also um what it has been like the past few years where, considering you've been involved in education as well as children's books how have you seen the consumption of children's books change and the impact oh, of pratham books oh it's phenomenal books? you know when we started pratham books in 2004 as part of the pratham network that i was belonging to which through the pratham network so many children had been taught to read and then when you started looking around to set up libraries for them there were hardly any children's books in india not even 5 or 600 we could find in all the languages for the 300 million children of india so we said kuch to karna hai something has to be done so we decided we will only start publishing books and we started in 2004 it's uh, uh, it's been an incredible journey one of the great things that we uh, decided to do was to put all the books out free in the creative commons and the kind of pick up that we saw people came to give their volunteer energy to translate to write new books um to read out books to children to download them and share them in their communities to edit whatever just the whole community response it became like a societal mission today is the story weaver platform i retired 10 years 5 uh, years ago but the new team has done even better and they've created a story weaver platform on which today there are books in 320 languages which are contributed by citizens of the world for children there are thousands and thousands and thousands of stories on that and there have been more than 10 million reads just in the last few years and we know that even the books of pratham books are selling so we have helped to change the paradigm of children's publishing in india and that's the power of bringing samaj sarkar and bazaar together by the way because the samaj came in as i told you to write read and as pratham books the sarkar came in because many state governments worked very closely with us to get books into children's classes to get the library periods activated and the bazaar came in because some of those books are also sold so it was a real coming together of these three sectors in a very wonderful example of what is possible when the three sectors work together for a common societal purpose absolutely and the books are also made very attractive they're all indigenous the art is Indian, incredible rooted in our soil rooted in our culture in many many languages tribal languages of india are represented and we found the most amazing illustrators yeah. who earlier didn't have opportunities to showcase their skills so the team has done extraordinarily well yeah. at pratham books yeah there are even uh, i have been lucky enough to write a book for pratham books and it's been translated into esperanto very good yeah there are languages all over the world that the books are in so what did you write about i wrote uh, a book that is level 3 i think it's ages 8 to 12 it's called starry skies it's just about the different stars oh, in the sky okay great i'll look out for it thank congratulations you. thank you thank you I so also I, have written 16 books for children um many of them for pratham books and they've been very popular which just goes to show it's a nation of storytellers and a nation of story listeners yeah so yeah. i think i'm getting some looks from your colleagues mm -hmm. telling me that you are needed for something else <laughs> and before these become dirty looks i think <laughs> sandhya we should conclude this session sure. we can go on for a long time sure 
Thank you so much, Rohini. This was a lovely conversation and we learned so much. I definitely learned a lot and I really look forward to reading your book as well. And thank you for answering all of our viewer questions too. Thank you to you, and Shekhar you, Rohini, also, thank Sanya. Thank you for agreeing thank to you. do it uh, in a physical form because you know, I just, I'm just so fed up of, I know. of the Zoom life. I know. I think all of thank us should you. get out now and... Thank you. It was a pleasure. ...and face the virus. We are all vaccinated. So. Lovely. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you so much. The Print of the Cuff, presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, Corporate Partner, AU Small Finance Bank.